right. Well, I want to welcome everyone to the sixth episode of Voices of Color, Skating and Stories. I would like to, with every show, remind folks that Voices of Color is not endorsed by or affiliated with Society for Creative Anachronism Incorporated. The views of the hosts and guests do not represent the views, values, or policies of the SEA Inc. And one of the reasons we want to say that up front is because our identities don't end at the gate. And so we can't separate the two. We're bringing uh, all of us into the authentic space to share our stories and hopefully bring some education and awareness to folks who are working towards allyship as well as validate the experiences of other people of color. My co-host today is Jessica. Hi. <laughs> Society DEI officer. And our special guest today is Amathula Luciano. Hola. So welcome. Hola. Welcome, welcome. Hola. Um, you know, we've had an opportunity to pre-interview as we do with uh, all the folks we meet with. But so far, you have had the longest stint in the SCA of anyone we've talked to. How long have you been in the SCA? I've been in the SCA since 1982. I, I, look, I, I, went, I went ahead and looked it up. So I got my little notes. And I've been in uh, the SCA since 1982. I started in the SCA in um, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Back when the SCA actually, the SCA of Atlantia actually went into the colleges to find people to, to be in the SCA. For some reason, they've stopped doing that. I don't know why. Um, I found out about the SCA from a book because I was um, my major was recreation administration and I needed a book, I needed to do a paper on leisure. And I found the SCA in a book as a leisure activity. And I went around, I said, now this sounds really cool. So I went around and I looked until I found a flyer with the tear off things at the bottom. If you want to go enjoy, if you want to, to find out more about the SCA, come to this place at this time, and I did. They had the meeting, I think if I remember correctly, it was in the planetarium. So that was, I don't know why, then, but that's where they had it. And uh, I just became enamored with it. Um, I started my SCA life as a Chinaman. <laughs> and I didn't start as an African or, 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 or of, of any kind. My, my hobby, my passion was China. And at the time, when, when, when you came into the meeting, you ha they had they ask you who you were, what your persona was. And I decided at that point that my persona was a, the daughter of a Chinese merchant near Mongolia. My name was Tao Tong Tai. And um, it was very amusing because the outfit I had was actually a Japanese kimono that I got from the university's Halloween sale. <laughs> the drama department sold their Halloween costumes, <laughs> sold their, their, their costumes that they had no more use for. And so they had a beautiful pink, green, and white kimono. 
And that's what I wore. That was that's what I wore for. That I was out on Sally. That is quite an origin story. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about the SCA though back then. What was the culture like? The SCA back then was looking for people, period. So you could, if you wanted to be a fighter, that was cool. If you wanted, they weren't so much into artisans at that point. Um, it was more fighter oriented, but it didn't matter who you were when you fought because armor was, you had on a t-shirt and a pair of pants, a pair of combat boots, a pair of welding gloves. And then on top of that, that was the base. And then on top of that, you had to have rigid knees and elbows, a kidney belt, and then armor, and armor ended up being carpet off the floor, literally. When they got done, if you went to where they had pulled the carpet up, you got carpet, cut a hole in it, dropped it on, armor. Your helmet was, could be a Freon can, and you had an eye slot that was this big. That's what you could see out of. And then you had holes punched so you could breathe. And you could, and that's all they could see of you, okay? So I have described what I had on. They couldn't tell race. They couldn't tell sex. <laughs> Until you took that helmet off. And they didn't care as long as they didn't know. So I was one of the, the kingdom, the, the area we lived in was Windmasters Hill. Windmasters Hill had fighters in Raleigh, North Carolina. Well, it was, Windmasters Hill is actually Fayetteville, North Carolina, out to the coast, and everything up to inland, up to Ram, Burlington, I think it is, is all in Windmasters Hill. And so that's where the fight, if you, this is, this is before cell phones, this is before um internet before internet <laughs> <laughs> so we would call each other and we jump in cars and go to fed or go to burlington or go to wherever up and down in east and west north and south and east and west and learn to fight and become a fighting team. Well, Capellenburg, which is what Chapel Hill was called, had three fighters and they were all women. And so we became the Amazons of Capellenburg. And we were all fairly large women so we would get out and we'd fight with the best of them. And they say, you did good, good job. And you flip the <laughs> helmet off and you flip the helmet off and they go. You did good. <laughs> because they just gotten their ass beat by a woman. <laughs> and it annoyed them. <laughs> but That area was so good that 
we that area had Sir Fern, who was at the time the only female knight, knight, actually knighted, went through the blah 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 to be a knight uh in um Atlantia. And she's almost never mentioned. When they say, oh, we've got, we, they, they knighted a, a new woman lately. And they say, oh, she's the first knight we've ever had. And no, Fern was the first knight you ever had. But Fern was in, I think about 85. And this lady was in, 2020, and we haven't had a female night between now and then. You know, that's the atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things I enjoyed about your story was was the interplay and interface between people who identified as male, people who identified as female in the fighting community. Have you seen it change over the course of time? Yes and no. And, and I say that because it's changed because the armor has changed. You can tell now there's a lady out on the field before she takes the helmet off her head. Um, and the guys have gotten rougher with each other, let alone with, uh, let, let alone with a woman. They've gotten rougher with each other. They, they won't acknowledge a hit unless you almost cripple them at this point. <laughs> but and the armor, because they started doing that, the armor got better. If you if they hit the way they hit now, and you had on a pet, uh, a, the carpet that we had on then, you'd have your arm, your leg would be opened up. Um. If um, one of the the helmet, one the, <laughs> they got rid of the Freon can helmet. They also had you could also have you could get a World War II uh, helmet and weld a plate across it so that it would cover. Oh my gosh. And that would do, but now if you hit that well, the well will break in. And also, one of the things we used, to, one of the things we used to do, illegal, 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 illegal. <laughs> we used to harvest. What was it? Harvest the highway, because the gauge of steel that you could make armor and shields out of was the same gauge of steel that you could get that that a uh, stop sign was made out of, or a <laughs> caution sign was made out of, or a street sign was made out of. So- <laughs> How'd you know? <laughs> <laughs> or um, in one case, it was if your car was a 66 or earlier, that was the gauge of steel you could make the you could take the hood of that car and make a make a suit of armor out of. <laughs> it's intense. <laughs> Hopefully, when people were done with the car, right? Like you get real dust red, start stripping your car. <laughs> <laughs> no, we was more worried about you pull the stop sign up out of the road off the off the side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> or they knock they, they, they back into the stop sign and go, oops. <laughs> and throw it back. <laughs> I, I don't I know. Just, I don't know what happened. I just uh <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 
big too. <laughs> and you knew this was happening because you have beautiful silver shield with stop sign on the back of it. <laughs> <laughs> really, you should put it on the front if you want to send a real message. <laughs> Um, but as for the, the, the mentality, I, the guys just stop encouraging their girlfriends to fight <laughs> because that's usually how it happened. The girls would follow the guys or the guys would follow the girls and the guys would get together and fight. And the girls would get together and make garments. And if a girl wanted to go out and fight, she could. But the guys would rather she went in the house and make garments. <laughs> because they did not want to go charging into battle. Now, if we were, if they were battle battling, which is, which is, if there was a war, they didn't, again, they didn't care. Everybody, every available person. But when they were fighting each other and training each other to have your head clocked by your girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's kind of interesting how you know, there was a point where you were talking about how the whole group was, it was three women fighters. And so mm -hmm. it's like, you built this. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually they just kind of stopped encouraging that demographic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, hopefully we're coming back around to a place where that's not the case, but, but you right. know, in the 80s. Right. Um, yeah, and in the 80s, it was, they needed, they needed, they didn't have enough, so they needed. They needed bodies. Yeah. yeah. The Amazons existed because there were no males in Chapel Hill that wanted to put on the armor and go out there and beat people. There were males in Chapel Hill. They didn't want to put on the armor and go out there and beat people. Stop signs and street signs and mm -hmm. car hoods, nonetheless. Right. <laughs> I want to carry around a stop sign. I just want that in my like everyday life. <laughs> <laughs> Make a shield out of it. <laughs> Another thing, let me. I'm gonna grab this. The shield I learned on. This is not one, but this is similar to it. was like this. And this is the very small shield by comparison. And you had to spend the day, I don't know if this one's okay. I gotta get it where the camera works. <laughs> um, and when you spent the weekend doing this and ducking behind it, you got you look, you got a pretty good strength on you. Um, if you had what they call a kite, which is the bigger shield, you didn't have to move it as much. But they trained, when they trained, they trained everybody, they started everybody with a flat top helmet and a round shield. Oh. I like a fashion yeah. though. <laughs> Yeah, it's a whole other language to me, this, uh, this fighter world. <laughs> and the thing about a flat top helmet was when you hit it, if you have a pointed helmet, it bounces off. If you have a flat top, you hit it, 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 it you hit it. And it knocks the whole helmet down on your head and your ears ring and... <laughs> Everybody and you and you can't see anything for a while because a the the little eye hole is now here. <laughs> <laughs> and you hear the birds tweeting. Many a guy <clears throat> that was annoying to many a guy when a girl would hit a flat top helm 
and he would boom on the ground. So and it was bad enough when they did it to each other. But that was I went from being a heavy fighter to being a combat archer because um it was just easier than carrying they had they had started going to you had to have heavier armor and an archer could still wear a carpet wear the carpet. And you couldn't, even then, you could, if you got within 10 feet of an archer, the archer was dead and they would supposedly, supposedly not hit you. So you actually didn't have to, it was actually set where you didn't have to wear as much armor at all. But Guys running at you tend not to stop. <laughs> 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 They've gotten their mojo. They, they're screaming and hollering. and So they figured out real quick you needed to have more armor than, than just regular <laughs> clothes, regular archery clothes. And, but one of the worst, one of the Worst cussing outs you'll ever get, you would ever get at that time is if your arrow, they could knock the arrow out of the way. And the arrow was a golf tube. I had one of them around here. It was a golf tube. And I don't know if you know what that is. Let me hang on one minute. Let me see if I can find that. <laughs> it was over here like, nope. Nope. I hit a golf too, but nope. <laughs> <laughs> this is like SCA museum pieces. Right. <laughs> I, mean, I, like, I, know. I don't hear a lot about the early fighting. I'm sure there are some fighters out there watching this who are like, what? Carpet? <laughs> like shag carpet? <laughs> like... <laughs> shag carpet would provide more protection, wouldn't it? More exactly. bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have I have heard of the days of the carpet armor, but it's another thing to kind of hear about it from people who used it. I'm like, just like I'm just picturing one of those. Um, you see the pictures of the people in full on like um, camo that 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 then have like all the weeds that they've strung from them. That's <laughs> what I'm picturing. Okay. So that's, that's a tube. And you pinched the end of it, cut it, taped it with duct tape. This was what this is what you put on the bowstring. This end had a piece of dowel, a piece of what y'all what's called memory foam now, but it was just closed cell phone. And then a golf ball, not a golf ball, a tennis ball, all duct tape down. And you put this on a string and shot. Regular standard bow. <laughs> and it might fly straight, maybe. Most likely. Um it flew to the left or the right. But when the when they're charging at you in the wide row, you hit somebody. Yeah. <laughs> and it annoyed them for you to hit them because usually you can knock it off and they don't feel it. So the people, the marshals would tell them, you just got hit with an arrow. And he go, what arrow, where? But the real thing that would piss them off was when the arrow would get stuck here in their helmet. <laughs> so then they couldn't deny that you got hit, they got hit by an arrow. They, the arrow is in your face. I'd be mad too. <laughs> un aerodynamic ass thing, just wham. <laughs> I didn't get hit, you turn to the side. 
Wow. This is a whole other side that I've seen. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I love it. This is this is this is your SPA history for today. Absolutely. <laughs> so <clears throat> I can't get that picture out of my head. <laughs> no, just giant ass arrow. <laughs> <laughs> This big dude, just an arrow, just stuck. It didn't get me. My dude. <laughs> Looking like a jank unicorn. I love it. I can't. Oh my God. <laughs> Too much. Too much. Uh, <laughs> one of the things we also talked about was you were one of the first black people playing in your area correct yeah what was that like and how have things changed if at all i i was never perceived I, I never perceived being the token black until they would somewhere else see another one. <laughs> and then they would say, or, or, or they had come from somewhere they had seen another one. And then there is a picture that I, that I took with Bambi and Robin and Denise and we wanted Gwen, but she wasn't there. But we put the three black ladies in one picture together. We had one of the one of the photog one of the people walking around take our picture so that they could understand there's not just one. Because I was perceived as the only one, but I, even today, they call me Bambi. Aren't you the one who does the the coffee? No, I'm not Bambi. Or they'll call me Gwen, or they'll call me Robin. And they did the same thing to them. They, they have only encountered, they've encountered very few, so they always think it's the same one. Um, no, I feel that that is that is an experience that we talk about here too, because I've been mistaken. I've been mistaken for people who were standing in the same circle as me, people who don't look a damn thing like me. Once we all took a picture together, just to be like, look, we're separate people. Um, or I get, so you must know that person then, right? But yeah, you must know yeah, them. Yeah, everybody knows everybody knows everybody. Fuck, they live across the world. <laughs> right? <laughs> about. People asking me about people in like on tier, you know them. And I'm like, oh. no. And of course, now that I do all this DEI stuff, usually I do. <laughs> so I have to be like, how dare you? I mean, yeah, but how but dare you? How dare you? you? <laughs> Um, but they, uh, uh, it, 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 in my life, it's been inadvertent. Um, like I said, they'll see me and go, oh, do you know such and such and such and such? Or, oh, oh, you're the one, or are you the one? <laughs> Um, otherwise, I'm just basically overlooked. They don't even notice I exist. I used to have a, I used to have a, a lady friend that went with me. And if we didn't go together, they didn't know who we were. 
if she went somewhere, went to an event by herself, they didn't know who she was. If I went to an event by myself, they would look at me and say, well, where is she? Um, so it, I like to stay in the background anyway. So I'm I'm not out front for them to use as the showpiece. Look, there's a black person. There's our there's our pet black person. So basically, I've I've fallen through the crack. They don't even notice me. Um, like um like I told you before, I. The first award I ever got was a Flame of the Phoenix in 2015. I've been in the SCA since 82. And nobody said squat to me, not that I tried for them to say squat to me. I'm, 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 I'm going to give you, I'm going I'm to I'm I'm make this statement because I'm giving, um, I don't look for the, I don't look for it. And I try and stay out of their way. When they get, when I got my, um, they eventually gave me a grant of arms, which they gave me in February of 2016. They had to catch me. They had an event, and I had a friend tell me, "You got to come to this event. I need to talk to you. I got to come to this. You got to come to this event, so I can talk to you." I'm like, okay. I got in the event, I got in the door, sat down, and they gave me the award. That's how that's how I stay out of range so that it don't bother me. <laughs> and I don't want an award. I'm not in it for I'm not in it for the we need a you need a uh, you need to be a laurel and a and a and a, and a peer and a blah and a blah and a blah and a blah and a blah. Yeah, okay. Why? Why do I need this? What is it? What's in it for me? And I had somebody tell me it's so you have networks, but. That's not the kind of network I want, <laughs> to be real honest. <laughs> yeah, I understand that you 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 think, but why? Okay. You're a pelican and a you're a, I don't I don't each each group has different names for whatever it is. You're a here and you're a, a, a knight. I can understand you've gone through the, the killing and feeling and to get it to be a knight. I, I get that one. But I asked what a peer was, and a peer is a knight for not fighting. I'm like, okay. I do good work. I so good. I I I I, I scribe good. I, I whatever good. Shouldn't that be its own reward? But that's me. <laughs> well, no, I think it's a it's an important topic, especially the person who's on next uh, was the first black peer in her kingdom. So this isn't a, an uncommon occurrence and mm -hmm. people are starting to recognize like, well, why is this happening? Because mm -hmm. obviously there are people of color who play this game. And so what is missing? Is it that, you know, I can, I can relate to your story because I'm like, I'm, I don't like being in court. I have a lot of social anxiety. I just want to do my stuff, which is hilarious being on this show. Uh, so there are times when I can do the thing. Right. Um, 
So I get that piece. And, you know, looking at the system, why are there so few people of color in some areas that have been have received awards because it's not just the it's less about the award and more about the recognition that you've been doing this thing and contributing to society is how I see it mm-hmm. yeah I mean I'm very I'm very extroverted I do a lot of things that are very visible um so I think it's a really interesting kind of dichotomy to be Uh, I mean, we're unique, right? There aren't a lot of people of color. We are memorable and visible by the dint of just being unique. But at the same time, we're talking about how we are mistaken for everyone else and potentially overlooked. Um, I know that I've seen people do the kind of like, oh, are you lost? Oh, you're here for the event because they're surprised. Yeah. And it's this really weird thing to be so visible and yet feel so invisible sometimes. Um, A lot, a lot, a lot of times I'm mistaken for a new person. I've been in this 75 years. You have, you've never seen me before. I'm I'm walking into an event that most of the people in it aren't, have never seen me before. And like, oh, you're a new person. Welcome to the SCA. Yeah, no. Okay. (laughs) okay yeah no it's 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 very strange and I feel like it really highlights some of the some of the nuances we talk about with regard to microaggressions right some of those finer points where people think that being othered is as simple as being called racial slurs or no there's a lot of nuance to feeling like you don't quite belong for little, little things here and there. Yeah, the, the, the main one is always being the new person. Yep. After you've been the old person forever. <laughs> which is, which is, you know, it's, it's setting you aside from the in-group. Mm-hmm. And it's it's denying you to some degree. It's denying you the respect of having built the group that you're in now, right? I mean, you were quite literally a pioneer in your area. You moved so much of this to where it is now. Um, I can't imagine having to deal with a constant kind of, oh, hey, welcome to the SCA. And it's like, mm, no, <laughs> sit youths <laughs> um I moved I moved from when I when I graduated from college I moved to uh Greensboro North Carolina I moved from Chapel Hill to Greensboro um with my ex-husband he and I both of us black we 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 the we now the couple <laughs> we the couple in the SCA. Um, we lived in what was called Heinz Crawl. Heinz Crawl was Greensboro, High Point, Winston Salem, North Carolina. And we both fall. He fought a while. We we played a while until we got tired of Heinz Crow. <laughs> because Heinz Crow treated us as the slaves they thought we were. And but Heinz Croft was the people who were in charge at that point in time were not nice to anybody. 
it was it wasn't it wasn't so much that they were racist, they were just generally assholes. <laughs> and so much so that Heinz Crawl no longer exists, it's now Middlegate. So after we left, I don't know what happened that it imploded. But I knew, but we all knew it was going to implode because that's the way it was. It was, it was racist and sexist and and, and misogynistic and, and and I am wonderful. You are not. And <laughs> If you're not in the if you're not in the clique, well, well, you sucks to be you. And it imploded. And they the people who lived in Greensboro High Point, Winston Salem, actually the people who lived in Winston Salem created Croy Bree. They just completely broke off and went on their own way. Um, High Point, so it became High Point and Greensboro. Now, back then, they would go to the University of North Carolina at Greensboro and recruit out the wazoo. There in Greensboro is University of North Carolina at Greensboro, Guilford College, Greensboro College, a and and Bennett. They go to the Green, they go to the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. They go to Guilford College. Greensboro College was T90 and like across the street from um, UNCG. So they would, the, if, if they, if people wanted to come from Greensboro College, that was found. On the other side of town where a and and, and, and Bennett were, no. They wouldn't even recruit. They wouldn't even go on that side of town. To this day, they will not even go to that side of town to try and get somebody to come. No, you know why I know that? I've asked. They said, oh, um, if you want to go, okay. I asked, I had, I live in, at this point, I live in Asheboro, North Carolina. The community college where I live wanted to have a, um, Medieval day. I said, okay, get in touch with these people. They got in touch with these people and nothing happened. Now, this is a community college of umpteen different types of people. They came to Middlegate, not Pine Scroll, Middlegate, and nothing happened. There, I don't know, but I haven't seen even at the even at Guilford College and UNCG. There's not a they're not trying. There's not a anybody. The lad they had they had one um, they had one person there, but she graduated. He. Graduated and moved away. And they haven't been back, as far as I know. And so when they say, we can't get nobody in the SCA, the SCA is dying out, blah, 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 blah. You got four colleges. <laughs> 
all you gotta do is walk and put the flyer up in the in the in the in the in the lounge. Comic book convention. Mm-hmm. Couldn't get them to go. They're like the Pendido. They got three cons they will go to in a heartbeat every time the door opens. They are there. Anybody else? Mm-mm. You can't get nobody in the SPA. Okay. Okay. I played with a different group called Adria Empire. We went to a con, a small con in Statesville, North Carolina, which is between Charlotte and Greensboro. And we, they were just absolutely fascinated. They wanted to find out more. They said, ooh, wow. Black people, white people, Chinese people, whatever people were just fascinated. They had no idea there was such a thing in the universe. And that's where, I think that's what, what people forget about is if you want diversity in the SCA, you need to go actively look for it. You need to actively recruit from places like historically back black universities, colleges that you need to go to community centers, um, you know, uh, centers of, um, in some cases, worship and really find the people where they're at. And at the same time, I also see the same thing where people are like, I'm not comfortable doing this. And I'm like, they're people. I'm not sure why you're not comfortable doing it. Like it's talking to people. Once I don't get it. Uh, and we don't have enough, at least in my experience, we don't have enough diversity when we are putting on um, uh, demos. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if, if there's no representation within the demo, someone's going to see that it's not for them. So I think there's a lot of angles that we miss. Um, and I'm glad that you've highlighted some of them. Because I don't think they've changed that much since 82. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're still, I'm always fielding questions. You know, how do we recruit better? And I'm like, well, where are you doing your demos? Like, where are you? And they're like, oh, well, we go to German Fest. I'm like, well. You'll get German. Well, That's fun. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. I mean, just in Chicago, right? There's the Africa House International. There's the Mexican American Museum of Fine Arts. Like, go to these areas, leave brochures, do demos in parks nearby, talk to, you know, if they do fairs, ask if you can set up a booth. And I think also you touched on it, but ensuring that we are not putting together only a narrow slice of what we do, right? Someone looks to the SCA and they go, oh, it's people pretending to be European knights. When in reality, we all know it's so much more than that, Mm -hmm. not only in terms of activity, but in terms of diversity of persona, right? I mean, there's, there's an intentionality that's necessary for inclusivity. Mm -hmm. and you're not going to just stumble into it by meaning well you need to make active choices to include groups that may have been traditionally excluded you know I always think of the it's it's the conundrum of you know do we end up having folks that we are already engaged with become the token representatives, Um, you know, because, because oftentimes, like, I can think of a handful of of people of color that I've met at events, like, it's really slim, Uh, you know, how do we avoid tokenizing people, and how do we build a a diverse and representative group? Uh, I don't know that there's a good answer for that. I know that there's some of us who are willing to 
I can only speak for myself, willing to be that token person if that's what it takes to bring in more people of color. Like, I'll do it all day long, all day long. Um, I, I think just we need an event that's all people of color so we can all see each other. I mean, part of what has been amazing about this show is the amount of people who have contacted me and I'm like, you're in Ontario. I've never met you. What is happening here, right? right? We need an event where all of us are together and that can be our advertisement. That can be our <laughs> SCA flyer. We put that on the website. You know, beautiful faces of color to really start breaking down those barriers and the, the, the notion that the SCA is full of white supremacists and KKK members. Right. Yeah. But we've done meetups. At like some of the wars, I know that folks have done meetups, which is super cool. I'll be, I'll be the look. We have diversity. Like I'll be <laughs> that girl to a point. Like if you're putting in real effort, if you reach out to me and you say, what else can I do? Like, can I, you know, what, what kind of crafts should I show? And what sort of garb should we wear? And where should we do it? If you do all that, fine. I understand I'm here and I'll do what I can. Mm -hmm. If your sole effort is somebody find a black person for me, then no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. And you can tell when you've been asked to do that. You can oh, absolutely yeah. tell. I'm like, oh, you needed a person of color real quickly. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, you need, gotcha. You, need, you needed that picture on your brochure. Yeah, okay. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. If it's uh, part of a cohesive effort, I totally understand, right? Yeah. We are limited. We yeah. are. But it can't be the only thing we do because what that does is it puts all that labor square on top of us. Mm -hmm. And I can't be the representative of Black people. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> None of us can, but I'm sure as hell I'm not going to try. Well, then there's, the, then there's the other thing that they, they told that one of the things that they told me was, okay, go over, you go over there and, 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 and get, a, get us in so we can go to the, so we can go to A&T and whatever. You go over there. Okay. If I had transportation, I would. Okay. I would take you at your work, but are you going to show up? Right. I can't do it by myself. Okay. Also, I can, I can get I can get your foot in the door. Are you gonna show up when I get your foot in the door? I, that would blow me a little bit. Like, do you think there's a secret handshake? Like, why don't you just go talk to people? Well, there, I, there's at least there's, there's, I know of at least two places in Greensboro that I can I personally can go and ask and set it up but are they gonna show up because i can't do it by myself right because i right. opened the door i opened the door for them to come to ashboro and they let the, then they let the, and they ignored it so i'm not real good at letting doors shut <laughs> i refuse Sometimes I just want to be like, I hear that you're uncomfortable being a white person going into a black person's world. Guess what? We love that every fucking day. Like, <laughs> welcome to our existence. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. We've had a lifetime to to figure, you know, to to get through this, and I understand that. But I mean, goddamn, it's people. Like, I, I don't get it. That's what makes me so upset is I'm like, so because the skin is a different color means you have to change the way you talk and interact and, and be a person? Like, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. I think it's fundamentally just that interaction is really the foundation of the issue, right? Like, yeah. the fact that we are othered is because, to some degree... There is a foundational belief that we are okay. different. Yeah. yeah. When in reality, I didn't even know the SCA existed until I was 25, 
this is absolutely the type of society that I would have been super into in college. I would have been very active. I am very active, right? Like this is something that I had been looking for forever. And my lack of having found it was just a lack of it appearing in the communities I was in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How many more people are like me who have no idea what we are or who have a wrong idea Mm -hmm. of what we are? And like I said, I found it in a book. Yeah. There's a lot of word of mouth involved. um, And there's a lot of kind of selectivity of what we represent and to whom we're representing it. And yeah, it's not surprising that the results tend to be a lack of folks of color. Although I will point out, we touched a little bit on it. Um, I do think that our retention for people of color is also an issue, right? Getting people in the door is one thing, but making them feel enough like part of the group or creating a space where they can see a space to step into, I think that that's another thing that we really need to think about. I was uh, watching, every time a video comes out that's like marketing or promoting the SDA, when I watch it and my partner does this with me, I count the number of people of color, obvious people of color in it, right? And I think there was one video that was quite long and I was like, I think I caught six out of the maybe hundred people featured on there. Like it's noticeable. You notice if you are, you know, purposefully or inadvertently left out of, you know, a community or even not just brought into the community. <clears throat> and I think it's, it's something that is not easily changed, but I also don't see a lot of effort put in to change it. I see pockets, but not a collective movement to do this. And I think that's, that's what frustrates me. But Amathula, how have things changed or stayed the same over the years? And I guess I should preface with it, preface this with a lot of posts that I see where people who have been in the SDA for a, a good bit of time, I, I almost exclusively hear the phrase, the SDA has always been an, an inclusive place, welcome to everyone. It wasn't until, you know, the last five, six years where, you know, political bullshit and all of these things happened. And I can't imagine that being the case, but you've been here for a while. What's your take on that? It hasn't. It hasn't changed. It's been mediated. It hasn't changed. It's been mediated. Okay. We were talking about. We were talking about this before. Back in the eighties, there was a thing called cloven fruit. That was when you took a fruit, grape, watermelon whatever, and you took whole clothes and you stuck them in. You took that fruit and you picked out a person and you handed that fruit to the person. The person was supposed to take the clove out, chew it, and then you could have a kid. You couldn't, if you did not want to do that, if you did not want that, you 
told them thank you no you told them you 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 laid the fruit on the table you handed it to the person beside them okay if you didn't want to do it if you wanted to do it you took the clove out you kissed it it allowed you to meet people you never met before It allowed you to decide about people that you'd never met before. It allowed you to kiss your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your, 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 your husband, your wife. It allowed that a girl could give it to a guy, a guy could give it to a girl. It allowed you to stalk somebody. It allowed you to make somebody uncomfortable. But when it was started, it was allowing you to meet somebody. Okay? You never ever, you never ever would have talked to this person, but they handed you a clove and fruit and you had to make a decision of whether or not you wanted to be bothered with that person. Now, all they see is, oh my God, he's trying to rape me, or she's trying to rape me, or she's trying to get with me. It's the same cloven fruit. It's a difference in the way it's looked at. So now you can't have a clover fruit. No. Mm -mm. Ain't even thought. No. Mm -mm. Can't. No. Back then so, it was like a given. <laughs> so what, are, what are some suggestions about alternate activities? Because I, I, as one, wouldn't feel comfortable with that. It's taken a dirty, ugly undertone. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> we're trying to eradicate it from society for many, many reasons. Mm -hmm. What would be some potential like replacements yeah, for it? There's not. There is no replacement for a club and fruit. Because there's no reason for you to walk up to somebody and say, hi. I do think that, oh, go ahead. No, 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 go for it. So I do think that while the fruit can introduce some problematic things, it's a really good point in that we can become very insular in the SCA. We get very much into our um, kind of friend groups or households or what have you. Um, and there's not a lot of motivation to extend beyond those groups. Um, Sometimes those groups are even determined by activity, right? Like mm -hmm. you hang out with your fighter friends, you go to fighter practice, you go out to eat or drink after fight practice, like you solidify a group. Now someone new is coming into the SCA and they're interested in archery and they're faced with this huge group of people that are somewhat homogenous in terms of interests, maybe hang out a lot outside of SCA events and it might be a little hard to break in. So I think it is worth talking about kind of how we get around those kind of cliques that can form and how we bring people in despite having these more, I don't want to say solid, because that's not really the right word, but ex expansive groups, right? I know that when I started in the SCA, I started in the <laughs> archery community in Chicago. Um, and we would have practice weekly. We would go out to drink after we had practice. We would hang out at events and the archery field is always out in just another state. <laughs> it is mm -hmm. as far away from everything for safety reasons, but it mm -hmm. is far. So you really form strong bonds with those people and maybe not so strong bonds with other folks, mm -hmm. um, which yeah, it can introduce some problems along the line. 
I would love to see some sort of mentorship. So I know we have chatelaines, you know, come and kind of greet folks, but connecting people with a more of a mentor and someone who is eager to show them the ropes. When I came in, you know, I was fortunate enough that I met all of the people I did as people outside of the SCA and then come to find out they're Uber peers. Uh, but our relationship has been different because it was so one-on-one, uh, -on -one. it was so interpersonal. And I think if we had some sort of mentor relationship or mentorship type of relationship where people can provide guidance and open you know, the doors to meeting other folks, that it might be helpful. And I especially think for people of color who come in and see like, holy shit, there's a lot of white people here, which can feel very isolating mm -hmm. and having a mentorship and someone that looks like them, uh, you know, can be very helpful. It also is a good way to find out where the safe places are right. um, and the safe people are. Uh, I don't know what that would look like and what it would change, but, you know, it's, it's something that's worked well in other areas. Yeah outside of the SCA, I should say. Well, I have, I have noted that <laughs> people come to SCA events and the chatelaine is basically the Atlantia has newcomers activity, but for the most part, if you're a newcomer, you're just wandering around looking at all this stuff. Nobody's, there's, like I said before, they look at me and say, hi, hey, how are you? You're new. But they don't do that for everybody. They don't do that. They don't even do that for each other. <laughs> and so, a stranger will come in and look at all this stuff and nobody stops to say, hey, how are you? This is what's going on over there. And this is, and this is part of the big picture. They see somebody new and they sit there and do this. Continue doing what they do. <clears throat> and then there's this person that's looking at this wondering, okay, what's going on? And nobody bothers to stop and explain what's going on. So I where, think some areas are better than others, yeah, but, you know, specifically think, yeah, specifically thinking like if we're going to outreach to historically black colleges or, or colleges that are more diverse, that having the kind of welcoming committee mentorship would be beneficial. I mean, a lot of the people who come into the SCA know someone, but if if we're going to do outreach, then we want to make sure that someone feels supported, especially if they come in and um, experience something adverse. What were you going to say, Jessica? Honestly, so before I was doing the DEI position, um, I had been trying to think about um, kind of expanding persona diversity and whatnot. Um, and a large part of that was going to be geared towards ensuring newcomers had the knowledge of what they could explore, the contact information for other people in the communities that they wanted to do study in, et cetera. Um, and I was thinking about something like, almost like an ambassador program. So you could have someone and it could rotate, it could be by event, it could be by group, it did, but you had someone that knew to kind of be on call for newcomers. So mm -hmm. at an event, this might look like designating one or two people at each different activity so mm. that somebody could say, hey, I'm new. Um, they told me to come chat with you. And this person would be ready to go ahead and help people, you know, teach them the ropes, get them started, 
um, kind of like a dedicated point of contact because it's one thing to be narrow and to be told, hey, this person is expecting you, they're ready for your questions, you know, they've got this sash or whatever. Um, you can go up, you can chat with them. They'll still get to do whatever they're doing in the meantime, right? They're not staffing a table like a newcomer table, they're mm -hmm. still having their day. Um, but it's so much less awkward to walk up to someone who you know is expecting you to do that than it is to just kind of walk into a group where you don't know anybody and you're like, uh, uh, I too do the thing, <laughs> right? It's, it's, just, it's just a little bit easier. Um, I'd love to see folks try out some variation of that. And I don't know that that would work. I never really, I never really tried it. Um, well, I, I, I would have, love to see folks have that more dedicated approach. Right. I had uh, one of the things that I encountered um, right before the, the last time we had a war before the pandemic. I I was walking along and they, mis they, they did the mistake me for somebody else. And I said, no, I'm not her. But the, there was a there was a black lady and a and a a white lady and they they were new and so I decided they were they were looking for something I don't remember what it was I said okay come on I'll show you where in Merchants Row it is and we went up and down Merchants Row and talked and had a wonderful time and I explained all the the ins and outs and she was from a different area I think she she, she what, I want to say she was from, from Illinois. And I explained to her who she should look for when she got back to Illinois and helped her find what it was she was looking for. And she seemed so grateful that somebody stopped to talk to and help her out. And I couldn't understand why nobody else had done this. But I was she was basically palmed off on me because I was colored, I was a person of color like she was. And they didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> and it's things like that that haven't really changed, they plan on, they keep saying diversity, 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 but they don't know what to do with it. And they have never known what to do with it unless we look like them. One of the things that I was told when I first joined and it's why I have the dress, the, the African colored dress, was that a black person would not look like, would not, a, a person from Africa would not wear their stuff. They would wear European stuff. They would try to blend in as opposed to stand out. So I made my European dress out of African materials, African fabric, because I figured that's what I would do. Okay, let me let me let me let me, let me go on a different tangent. I stopped being Sarutong Sali because they had no clue when I joined about the Orient. The, uh, about Asia, they couldn't figure out for the life of them how my name would work, <laughs> how my persona would work. <laughs> so when I moved from Chapel Hill to Greensboro, my husband was a Moor. And that's all they knew. Spanish more. Period. If you were black, you were a Spanish more. Period. Period. 
<laughs> you are not from Ethiopia. You are not from Asia. I mean, you are not from uh, Arabia. You were a Spanish boy. So I became that's Amatulu Luciano is a Spanish Moor. This was in 93. I couldn't get Saudi to pass. I sat down with then only other black person as far as I knew in there, which was a male named Akbar. And he said, we got my name, Amatula Luciano Pat. I am still Amatula Luciano, but I am an African potter living in Spain. My husband was a Spanish, no, my husband was a Spanish soldier who got killed in the war. He got divorced and he got rid of it. <coughs> um, I can give you all the pertinent information because I'm third, um, from, I, gotta, I don't remember exactly, I think it's from 13, I know it's thir the year at present is 1359. Um, I can tell you what's going on in Spain right now. <clears throat> um, but I am no longer an Arab Spanish Moor. I am an African living in Spain. That's not, that's what's changed. <laughs> You've gone from being, God, you must be a Spanish Moor to Arabic, Persian, um, African, Egyptian. <laughs> And there's absolutely Chinese, Japanese, Korean. <laughs> That's what's changed. And I think there's absolutely there the perception. No, there was before, before when I started, there was no Asia. There was no Africa. There was you. Hmm. And when they had that fit of they were gonna the when, 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 when diversity first started and they had that fit, it, the, in my personal opinion, this is my personal opinion, the reason they decided to diversify was because when they started this, you were French, German, or English. Period. So everybody who was from Spain, everybody who was from Norway, everybody who was from um, Russia did not exist, just like us Africans and Asians, because they were not from France, Germany, or England. So they diversified so they could keep the Vikings, the Spaniards, and the Russians. But that's my opinion. Yep, yep, yep. You're muted. Oh, you're muted, girl. You're muted. <laughs> We've had some shows where folks have talked about, you know, trying to explore their own culture and, and being hampered by you know the ideals of society or feeling pigeonholed into one thing and I think that you know we do need to start building resources that are for more diverse um, personas and find ways to help people get in touch with folks who can help them down that line uh, there's some there's a couple of folks that I know who are doing some amazing work 
on their personal culture and, and bringing that into the overlap into the SCA, but for some, it's really hard. Mm -hmm. um, you know, hopefully with, you know, getting in recruitment and doing some work with mentorship or whatever the future holds, then we can get some people networking and really talking about these other uh, personas that existed regardless of what some still think. Um, I wanted to make sure that we didn't forget about allyship. Um, that's one thing that we have in every show because we have allies who are watching and given, you know, especially given your time in the SCA, what does maybe an ally look like and what, what concrete things can people start doing today to be an ally? Okay, what do you mean ally? Well, so our definition has kind of been <laughs> all over the place, but someone who can be supportive of um, diverse groups of people, supportive to helping people get further in their SCA, uh, really being the support that is needed at the time. And we have a very clear differentiation between, um, we get to call you an ally, like you earn that badge mm -hmm. from the people you are supposed to be helping. And that allyship looks different for different groups and can look different for different people, but really supporters, when it comes down to it, these people are, are supporters of making things better for marginalized groups in the SCA. That I can't answer because in my point of view, those who In my point of view, there's no such thing as an ally. Um, there are people who there are people who don't suck. <laughs> um, it should be a given that you're gonna you're gonna help me do what I want to do in the SCA. And it doesn't matter who you are, where you are, what you are, how you are, whatever. Um, in the, back in the 80s and 90s, you said ally and I thought about the, the L, LGBTQ. Uh, <laughs> that bunch. <laughs> and I know I'm being very, very negative when I say it that way, but I'm, I'm sorry. Um, when you put on your garb, nobody knew what you were. You were whatever you were in your garb. And unless they took your garb off, they didn't know what you were. Yeah. So you, if you were a guy that wanted to dress as a girl, and you didn't tell nobody your name was Elizabeth of, of Pine Scroll, fine. What you were the next day when you left the place, that was your business. But while you were in the SCA, in the event, 
in the whatever, you were Elizabeth of Highscroft. You were John of Windmaster Hill. Now, everybody's in everybody's business. <laughs> it doesn't, it supposedly, when you go to an event and you put on your garb, you are somebody else. It doesn't matter who the somebody else is. What, what we've got away from is that thought process. That when you are in your garb, you are whoever you say you are. I am Amathula Luciana. I'm not a black woman. I'm not. I'm Amathula Luciana. Nice to meet you. And if you treat like that, there shouldn't be, I mean, that's my, I guess that's my idea of an ally. Treat me like my like like I say I am. Treat me as the as you would treat a person we're all supposed to be nobles. Okay. So treat me as the dignitary from Africa that I am, or treat me as the noble that I am. If I ask you how to make a, uh, how to weave, teach me to weave. Show me how to weave. If I, if you come to me and ask me to help, ask me to help you make a pot, I will. I don't care who you are on a day-to-day -day basis. We are medieval people at this event. So I think it's really interesting to kind of hear the varying perspectives because this is one of those times where we as people of color are absolutely not monolithic in our thinking. Um, I know for me, more recently come to the SCA, um, I very much don't leave who I am at the door. Um, you know, even within the SCA, I am still a woman of color. Um, I still carry a lot of the day-to-day -day of my everyday life in with me. I, I do think that you're highlighting something really important though, which is the idea of connecting with people on the basis they want you to connect with them on, right? Um, and so I'm gonna speak a little bit to allyship in terms of being sure to do what the marginalized group you are trying to support wants you to do, right? Assuming that you know best, assuming that your, your take on what they need is best is not a good call. If people want you to do a certain type of thing, if they want you to support them in a certain way, um, if they want you to be a voice for them, or if they want you to stay back and let them speak for themselves in different scenarios. I think that that's really important. Um, listening to people and understanding that people are going to have different takes. We are not monolithic. We don't all think the same. Um, and that's okay. Uh, what other people would consider respectful, I might prefer a different approach. And the only way to really do that is to treat people as individuals and not as abstract entities of X, Y, Z, whatever that group is. Um, we also touched really briefly um, on, well, briefly, we kind of kept coming back to the idea of recruitment and retention. Um, I think for me, uh, being a good ally and facilitating that, uh, for the SCA would probably look a lot like understanding the communities that you've othered and then being very intentional in how you address them, right? I think 
that there are a lot of folks who are going to have to sit with some degree of discomfort, dealing in spaces that they don't understand, spaces they haven't encountered before. And the only way to learn is to listen to the people who are in those spaces who may have gone ignored right up until that point. Um, so approaching recruitment and retention with, with intentionality and specificity um, and really just a willingness to learn, a willingness to accept that the approach that you think is gonna work might not work and you really just need to listen to these people and let them tell you what works for their communities. Uh, I, I think those are, my, those are my allyship takeaways for the night. <laughs> Nina? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I wanna echo that, I mean, I think it's 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 easier said than done to just say now that I've put on garb, I am a you know French woman, blah blah blah. I, I haven't really gotten my persona under wraps, but um, I chose French at the time because Haitian was not Haitian, which is my heritage, was not accessible. Um, so when I come in the gate, like I. I don't stop being myself and I feel myself in my skin at all times. I'm also of the LGBTQ community and my partner plays. And so I don't, we don't have that, especially if we're together, we don't have that option to kind of drop that label and be something that we're not. So I think it's, it's recognizing, recognizing the different ways that people show up and how to support folks. Ideally, we could live the dream. Ideally, we could all walk in and this would be a, you know, welcoming, inclusive place where we're all accepted. So it's not an issue, but we know that's not the case. Um, you know, I think a lot about the, um, the anti-Asian xenophobia that we've seen with the, um, with COVID. And that people who are, you know, of Asian, Asian American descent, that that's something that that harm follows with them. Like that is that is something to that is hard to let go. I think about the um, racial injustices and the Black Lives Movement. Like I know for me, man, that that shit doesn't stop. It's at work. It's in the SCA. It's it's everywhere, and it can be a burden and if it's not acknowledged, then I feel incomplete. And so I think that when we're talking about allies, again, I think you're, you know, really talking to making sure that you know who you are talking to and what they're bringing into the space. Um, and, and really when I, I think going a step above and beyond that, it's, it's really important that peers, people in peerage positions, people in positions of power, recognize that they have this, especially when we're talking about allies, recognize the positionality so they can leverage that to help those who are, you know, uh, less connected or have less access to resources and really leverage their, their positions. I think that I think I've said it several times in the show, but like peers step up, royalty step up. You know, you have the voice. You have you have the uh, in a lot of in a lot of ways the credentials that some of us don't, and people listen to you. So, uh, kind of reiterating that. Get to it, all y'all, <laughs> all y'all peers. I'm still looking for that. Um, you know, I want to thank you for the discussion. You have so much history in the SCA and just looking at the comments, people are like, wow, you know, it's so interesting to hear about all of the ways that the SCA was in 1982 up until now. Um, it's something that I think gets lost a lot. And I hope that someday you'll be able to kind of put it on paper, maybe a scrapbook, <laughs> so we can kind of really memorialize that time though, right? Like I think I think of the um the person you said who was the first fem female knight, like we should have that documented. That is a celebration. Uh the person coming up next month, first black uh peer, like we should memorialize that. That should be celebrated and and have these pieces of history for folks to look at because it's really empowering. 
Um, do you have any last thoughts? Back in the day, because we were just starting out everybody helped everybody else if you needed a ride you had a ride if you if you needed to get to fight a practice you could you called until you found somebody who was going to fight a practice to come by and pick you up if you didn't have armor then we had loner armor out the wazoo we had loner helmets we had loner whatever if you wanted to fight you could fight Now it's all mine. I think some spots are better than others. Uh, part of the reason, I mean, the major part of the reason that I stayed is uh, my barony is so full of such amazing people who will drop everything to help you in and outside of the SCA. But I do like the idea of creating more community where you don't have to go it alone. Because it sounds like a lot of what you did, did initially was you did it alone. You didn't have a community of people to support you. And hopefully we can see that change. Hopefully folks in your area have seen this and are like, man, Amathula has some shit to say. Well, I need to connect with her. <laughs> Thank okay. you so much. I have really enjoyed this. This has been a really good conversation. And I could enlighten slightly, but like I said, all of this is my opinion, so. Stop. <laughs> and that's why this space is here. <laughs> um, thank you again for being on the show. Next, in two weeks, we have Andrea Bala, so October 5th, and then Roberto Fernandez Morales on the 19th. Um, you know, we're hitting into our last couple months of 2021 and uh, really going to look towards the group to provide us feedback about the show. We are over two thirds booked up for 2022. Uh, I hadn't decided whether or not like I wanted to continue this. And then I realized that for myself, for Gigi, for Jessica, really this, this is a way to feel validated and just hold space with people that we've never met before. Um, and it's been a really powerful experience from comments that I see and emails, you know, this is not just something for us by us, which is where it originated, but it's something for everybody to learn and grow together. So I hope y'all will, will tune in um, in two weeks. And in the meantime, I'm going to say it because I'm going to say it. Wear a mask, wash your hands, get vaccinated if you can, because I am tired of living in my house. <laughs> and on that note, thank you all for joining. Have a great night.